Welcome to Nordic by Nature on survival. It's been a hot summer with amazing electrical storms and unpredictable weather. I've been at home reading about the Norwegian philosopher Arne Ness. Arne Ness defined the term deep ecology and offered a serious vision for systemic change. For example, Number one, humanity cannot survive without nature. We need to design all our systems and concepts around that notion. Our current economic model of perpetual growth, for example, is not viable nor useful for the dignity of mankind. Number two, diversity is at the heart of all life. We need to cultivate biological and cultural equity locally as well as reducing carbon emissions globally. Our coexistence with nature is dependent on the equity of our global community and the legal and moral right of every living being to exist as part of that ever-changing ecosystem. Number three. Organizations must review their societal purpose and enable sustainable livelihoods. Our governments and organizations need to declare a global climate emergency and mobilize together. You will now hear three people working towards that change. First, culinary curator Monica Kucha explains how she takes the ego out of food. Monica runs a farmers and producers market in Warsaw, Poland, and hosts cultural food events that connects all types of people. You will then hear from design leader and educator Daniel Wall. Daniel's book, Designing Regenerative Cultures, is a must-have for anyone interested in transformative innovation. Lastly, you will hear Helena Norbeg Hodge author of Ancient Futures, a seminal work that compares the way of life in the Himalayan region of Ladakh before and after globalization. I hope you have time to sit back and relax and listen to this podcast with your headphones. My name is Monica Kutia and I'm a food writer and a curator. So I design uh, culinary events that are also artistic and have uh, some social aspect. Everything I do seems to be around food, but I find more and more when I get older that it's Everything is actually connected. And if food is the medium that I use in my work, it's never only about food. It's always about connections, relationships. It's about art. It's about history. It's about family. This what really makes my heart beat faster if I see that I am able to join all these aspects around the table and around the taste, around the experience of eating or cooking. I think I was sort of born with this intuition. So I started uh, being interested in food very early, like when I was a teenager. Then um, when I started writing about it like 20 years ago, it was just fascinating that it's so different in every region also it's very different in every personal story probably you have completely different story than i have we actually can say that there is the food voice so there is something that you express about yourself through the food it's like the sun and everything else is moving around it it's sensual so it involves all our senses 
And also it connects people because it's about feeding and feeding is giving the energy. So it's about the flow, how it goes between the people. Everywhere I go and I meet food people, I always connect with them instantly. They have similar sensitivity or a similar approach to many things. They are more open maybe. So it's a big tool for making friends for talking about anthropology, for also having fun and in enjoying yourself. It's everything in one, you know. <laughs> as humanity, as people, we went wrong somewhere, probably in the 20th century or even maybe before that, when there was the Industrial Revolution. I would blame the mass production, basically, and the greed and the indulgence, it's more now about pleasing oneself than about feeding myself. It's not always that if I want to please myself, it's actually good for me or good for other people or good for the planet. Because we have means and we have the global uh, system, we can have any food we want. And in the end, it's not a good thing. It destroys the nature. We went wrong and maybe there is no way back. But what we can do now is make our personal choices that are wise. We should use our knowledge and awareness to stop the process of destroying uh, our home, which is the earth. So we started doing the farmer's market in Warsaw. We prepared it for a long time. And the idea is to bring the real food with the real people that are making it to the people who live in the in a city. We have some markets like with organic food in Warsaw. We have markets with the producers, other markets. In this area where we started it, in Praga, in Koneser, Centrum Praski Koneser, there is nothing like that. So we thought that it's good to give it a shot. And for me, what's really important is that there is a relationship possible, that you can talk to the person who produces the food. So it changes our attitude and the way we are used to do shopping nowadays that you just come to the shelf and pick whatever you want because you are the king. You are the king of the um, supermarket. And here is a person who's touched all these uh, sausages or fish or veg or cheese or anything else that we have there with their own hands. This is personal. Shopping becomes personal. You will get to know these people it's very important to respect these people. So just to show them respect because they work very hard and they give us very good quality, healthy food. For me, it's a work of turning around the idea of shopping. It's more about me coming to these people to get my food, to feed my family, rather than being the picky gourmet customer who just uh, looks for the best product. I think we should really support each other and we should really change the proportions. The village feeds us, so we should appreciate them and we should respect them. We don't value food anymore because it was so cheap. It can be so cheap and it's so easily obtainable. We are facing the fact that it might change during our lives, like that the food will not be that easily obtainable. I had a grandmother in a little village and she worked really hard because it was like a small farm and everything was from this small farm, everything we had. 
what it means that there was no trash, there was no garbage. Nobody would ever take any trash because there wasn't any. There was a shop in this village and it was open twice a week for, I think, four hours. There was no plastic, so I remember buying like notebooks for writing. There was not much in this shop. So they would produce everything for themselves, exchange with the neighbors, and it was very hard life. It was not fun waking up at five o'clock in the morning. It's not something that we would regard as this nostalgic, sentimental vision of the village. So what I'm saying is that I understand that we have become so comfortable, like in the cities, like this probably 2% of uh, all the people in the planet, that we have the access to the goods from all over the world, and we don't have to really work with our hands. Obviously, nowadays, they have machines, they have resources from the European Union, they get money. It's very different. The simple life is hard. The simple, basic, uh, one small farm with two cows and one pig farm is just hard life. Therefore, we should appreciate and respect the people who still take the effort and they actually do it with their own hands rather than eat the artificial food becomes less and less actual food it becomes a product it becomes processed uh, item that has no connection with where it comes from usually we don't know where it comes from we don't ask this question when we buy i don't know ready-made pizza you don't really ask the questions where the ingredients come from climate change this is something that I think most people don't really take seriously. This is us being lazy. It will finally probably kill us if we keep doing it. Cooking some potatoes and some carrot and uh, it doesn't take that long. This is more about our approach. People make choices and sometimes it's more important to do something else. But still, I observe here in Poland that we have had so much ready-made food in the last five years that I had never seen before. Still with this huge interest in cooking, in food, in the culinary programs, culinary books, all these like celebrities, there is more and more ready-made food. Cooking becomes a luxury in a way. With our farmer's market is a struggle, I would say. We need to convince people that it's better to come there, to get to know these people and come every week, to have your eggs straight from the farm, to have your meat, if you eat meat, and to have other things straight from the people. But this is the effort, and this is in your mind. This is how you see yourself, how you see the community, how much you connect. I never would say that food is the most important thing because people can be extremely healthy and destroy their relationships, destroy the planet, destroy themselves in a different aspects like emotionally or spiritually. So what I'm saying is that food is just one of the factors. I don't believe that anything can be taken apart, like separated from other things. Food is something that everybody needs every day, true. But if you live in harmony, and I'm not saying I live in harmony, but I know some people who do, they have this sense of proportion. 
So there is the place for food, but they are not crazy about it. We want the children to be healthy so they shall eat healthy food. But, you know, when you don't respect yourself and don't mean good for yourself, you will never understand why do you need this healthy food. It's about the relationships you have. It's about the family you create, friendships. If you mean good for yourself and for the others, if you are open-hearted, then you eat the food that actually nourishes you and is good for you. And you are aware of all the aspects because you are aware. So food is actually a part of mindfulness, I would say, as much as anything else, like sleeping, loving Food just reflects our attitude towards us, towards the planet, towards other people. The same is about uh, clothes, making clothes, buying new clothes, new shoes. If we realize how much effort and pain and struggle there is behind this food or the clothes or other goods that we are getting, if we realize how cruel it, the business is, then we would really make different choices, probably, as consumers. So it's not just white Western world, it's more about the economic power. This why, if you want to be fair, it's better to buy locally, because then if you know where it comes from, you can say that you do honest uh, choices. Otherwise, you never know. So this why coming back to these communities, I'm, for example, in this group on Facebook that it's only with my neighbors, like not neighbors in my building because I know them personally, but like in the district, in the area. I think this is the future. There is a lot of exchange. There is a lot of no money business. We have the currency, the avocados or wine are the currency, something that we all want more like a barter but there is also the currency this is something that it's so informal there is no bureaucracy i just lent you my bike because you need it and i trust you and you will give it back after two days and i trust you with that and this is normal behavior and it's not it's nothing new like people have lived like this forever probably because we depend on each other but what I'm saying is that with the global globalization and with with these problems that it brings with itself, the only solution is to get back to these roots, to something that is real and it's it's just close to you and you can touch it. I just believe that the future is sensual, getting to make stuff with our hands, really. I believe this is the only rescue. We will never create a proper paradise, probably, <laughs> here. But when I'm creating my events, the, the things that I'm doing with the food and around food, with connected with culture and rituals and some traditions and history, I just see that people want to have something real. This is really what wakes them up. It brings real value rather than just fun or entertainment. What I believe and what I'm doing is to get people involved rather than present something so they are viewers and that they can judge it.
if you are a part of something, then you feel responsible for it because it depends on you. It's up to you. You are a participator. And this is what I believe also in gastronomy. Like this is why I work with the village women, with homeless people, with unknown cooks. What I'm saying is that when you have the famous chef, of course you relate to this person or to the dish you can get very touched, very emotional. But on the other hand, you have this chef who wants to be famous. And then you have the customer who also wants to be regarded of a higher status because they can eat in this place, because they have money. This is about ego, all of it. This is not a simple exchange. It's more about the status and then about the the whole spectacle, but meaning like showing off. For me, what's more important, more interesting to explore is all this world of other people who also feed their families, feed other people, but they don't do it to show off. We are all makers and we are all capable of doing things. I also go to the little villages to listen to old people who still sing the old songs like real folk music. I've been told that in the traditional singing, the songs is most important. So the song goes through the singer. We are only passing it through. Also the recipe, the traditional whatever, spaghetti carbonara or Polish broth or pierogi or whatever. We are just transmitting. We are the stewards and uh, this is about not being too humble because you can be a great steward, but you don't own it. And here is that the song doesn't belong to anybody. It belongs to the community and the singer has the privilege to sing it. When there is less ego, then you just enjoy the process because you are connected and you are a part of something bigger than you. This is what really makes us feel really safe. Safe like, you know, like beings that we are connected because this is what we all want somewhere inside. In the food area, it's also for me important to remember that food is about actually about feeding. You feed your family, you feed yourself, you feed your uh, community in whatever way you can, because you can feed them with words, you can feed them with films, you can feed them with food. Especially in Polish, there is the word pożywienie is more like giving life and it means food. This is very important for me to remember this. I'm just serving. I'm serving something, but you respect me for serving this to you. There is no power game in it. This is uh, how I try to create the events. And and I have had this experience for several years now that people need it. I don't believe in the fixed national uh, nationality, like in the way that my identity is solid, because I'm the traveler and everybody is a traveler. If my life is a journey, then I'm changing. I'm just an inhabitant of the earth, basically, at the moment. Anything that it's stiff and w- which is and like a monument, it's never real. And if something is real, nobody will take away it from you. It's impossible. We are flowing with whatever is happening through the history. And please remember that kitchen is something that never stops. It's always changing. If we say about traditional cuisine, to what point do we refer? What year? What period? It's like telling fairy tale. 
It's constantly changing because people bring products because we are omnivores, so we eat everything. It's constantly changing. There is no other thing that changes so fast as cuisine, as uh, the food world. I'd rather say kitchen in Poland than Polish cuisine. People are scared and they need to hang on to something because they don't want to accept the fact that it's all about insecurity. This is also about the ego. Nature will win anyway. Nature doesn't need us. It's not like that we are an important factor for the nature. If you watch Chernobyl, yeah, it's growing back. So the nature will deal with this problem when there is no more humans. Maybe we are coming to a disaster. I don't know. But also in my only my intention matters. So if I do the right thing as much as I can do, I try hard. It's about my heart. It's not about anything else. I'm not optimistic for humanity. It's about system. It's about the big money that is behind these things that are happening that took us to this point where we are. This is about fossil fuels. This is about global politics. The system is just making it more dangerous for the planet. Uh, the ego is the center. Or central problem <laughs> is the ego. My name is Daniel Wahl. I used to be a marine biologist, got disheartened with reductionist science and lack of including other ways of knowing into the way we do science, and ended up doing a master's in holistic science at Schumacher College. At, at that point, I realized the power of design in putting this new holistic worldview of Gaia theory and Goethean science and holistic science interaction, and have been on this path ever since of exploring how we can redesign the human presence and impact on Earth within our lifetime so we can actually have a future as a species because we're currently facing the possibility of short-term human extinction if we don't fundamentally change our ways. Life is a planetary process, and we're part of that planetary process. 
I work a lot now with with the term regenerative design and regenerative development. Sustainable being something that is, is really ways of doing things that don't add any more damage to the system and restorative and regenerative going beyond that and actually trying to undo the damage that we've done over so many decades and centuries of very unsustainable practices. So it's very much about finding solutions that come out of place, that are attuned to the story that the place itself wants to tell and the people who've lived with it for generations. But it also is, is central that it's about enabling their capacity of the people who actually live in that place to respond to change as inevitable. My belief is that design has a huge part in making that possible. Well, the process of the United Nations responding to climate change has been painfully slow. With the Paris breakthrough, there's been some form of commitment of staying under two degrees average warming globally. But more recently, the IPCC has uh, revised that uh, and has said that it's necessary to actually stay b below 1.5 degrees. The reality is we're not on track at all. We're on track to six, seven, eight degrees warming, which basically would mean the unraveling of ecosystems around the globe and the end of civilization as we know it. The most recent report in, actually it was November 2018, gave the world 12 years to fundamentally respond to this crisis. But I think that, again, the IPCC has a tendency to be conservative so they don't get criticized. And 12 years is too long of a window of opportunity to give ourselves. I think Antonio Guterres, the Secretary General of the UN in, in September last year, was probably more on the mark by saying that if we don't respond within the next two or three years in a way that is unprecedented in terms of international collaboration, then we might have triggered runaway climate change to a point that even if we decide afterwards to do something about it, it would be too late. We, we don't even know half or more than half of the species yet that exist, particularly the species in the soil, microbes. We're just at the beginning of cataloging them all, and really that's where soil fertility starts and with it the foundations for higher life forms. It's really understanding that every single species does matter and has a role to play in creating this collaborative symbiotic system that is basically life as a planetary process. And, and we're part of it and we're completely dependent on it. I strongly believe in the power of design. I think ultimately it's about design as human intentionality expressed through interactions and relationships. It covers product design, but it also covers other more complex issues like monetary systems, transport systems, our whole economic system, even the way we do research in the different academic disciplines. There's a design decision at the beginning of each discipline. So basically any act, human intention has a design element in it. In that sense, the most powerful design intervention is the meta-design intervention of changing people's worldviews and value systems and the stories we tell about each other and, and our relationship to nature. When you shift that, then our perceived and our real needs shift. And with that, our intention shifts and everything downstream changes. I think design is powerful and designers very often oversell it. And most design schools still haven't actually woken up to how critical design and deep ecological design thinking could be to the survival of our species. There are a lot of companies out there who are supplying things we don't really need or they're supplying them in a way that is based on programmed obsolescence and turnover of products. And I don't think that that kind of business practice has a future. I think we need to create much more durable products that are much more easily repairable at a local level. But we also need to 
create products that are, to some extent, the components are more recyclable. But really, if you go deeper, you realize that most of the materials we make things out of, we're going to run out of sooner or later. So all that thinking around circular economy and the two loops in the circular economy diagram or the cradle to cradle diagram, the, the industrial metabolism and the biological metabolism, they're really just concepts. Ultimately, we're going to have to shrink the industrial metabolism because most of the materials in that cycle, we won't be able to recycle forever. So one of the big oversells around that is this concept of upcycling. It doesn't actually work to upcycle things indefinitely unless you have a free source of energy and there is no such thing. We're really needing to fundamentally shift our material culture towards more biomaterials that are regeneratively grown in the region, for the region, and based on the resources that that particular ecosystem has to offer. It has to be done in such a way that it doesn't destroy the rest of the ecosystem. To the contrary, it has to be done in a way that regenerates the ecosystem. Basically, these companies are beholden to their shareholders. They operate within a system that is fundamentally exploitative and degenerative. And that system is our current economic system, the way that we've designed money and the way money is created and the way that we have differential interests on deposit and loans and therefore create an economic playing field that is based on zero-sum thinking, so basically on winners and losers. And while we have a system like that, and we have that necessity that a national economy needs to grow at a minimum at 3% per annum, otherwise it collapses, there are a lot of top-level sustainability-minded CEOs that really do care. And yet they are stuck in a system where, to some extent, most of what they do is moving deck chairs on the Titanic. Ultimately, they really need to consider that maybe the assumption that these companies, just because they've been around for 100 years, have to be around for another 100 years, might be an erroneous assumption. Maybe some of these companies actually have to program for their own or design for their own death in ways that they can then re-emerge and like a phoenix from the ashes as knowledge networks that help more regional production and regional cons consumption with the innovation and, and development that they've been very good at. That's at the CEO level. But for a lot of people who are working in these companies, who are beginning to see that their children are not going to school on Fridays because they're claiming their right for a livable future, or they see London being disrupted by the Extinction Rebellion and more and more people getting more and more verbal about the fact that it's five past 12. We don't even have a guarantee that we are still going to be able to make it if we do things fundamentally different now. Most people today are still somewhat stuck in beginning to realize how profound the changes are that we are now called to do individually as communities, as nations, and as one human family. And at the same time, making sure that our kids are in school and that we can pay the bills so the, the food's on the table. But we are facing transformative change in a way that these incremental innovations and these incremental changes just aren't going to make it in time. So hold on to your hat. We have to relearn how to collaborate, moving from competitive advantage to collaborative advantage and um, realizing that we're all in this together living spaceship Earth is in danger of collapsing on us. We're living in a dream nightmare that, that tells the story that we're somehow separate from nature, that culture and nature are not one. I'm increasingly thinking that working bioregionally is the scale at which we can make the biggest difference. Bioregionalism has been around since the late 1960s and this whole concept of rehabitation, re-inhabiting our bioregions and reconnecting to the biological cycles, the ecological cycles of those regions. 
increasingly also the, the conversation about what would sustainable cities look like, understand that it is a reconnection of the city back to its region. So I could definitely see that there could be models developed in, in Sweden. It's the same with a lot of regions that people have, have strong allegiances to their particular region. And so I think that's a great starting point because one of the core things about regenerative development and creating regenerative cultures is that they are born out of the uniqueness, the the biocultural uniqueness of place. They are sensitive to both the ecological and biological uniqueness of the ecosystems they inhabit, but they also are sensitive to the historical cultural dimension of how people have lived in relationship with nature and with the elements and with climate and with the patterns of that particular place. And I think it makes makes a lot of sense to rekindle those regional identities, but to not do so in a sort of parochial, let's go back and pull up the drawbridges and, and create lifeboats in a turbulent world, but as understanding that that is the scale of action for a globally collaborative effort to heal the planet that we have raped and pillaged, basically, and in doing so, possibly also heal ourselves, heal our relationship to each other and heal the relationship between humanity and nature. I know that in Costa Rica, there's a movement to create a bioregional regenerative development case study in in one part of the country. And actually, the whole country is looking at adopting regenerative development as as their main development strategy. Things are, are shifting. Luckily, I also see that there's a confluence of movements in all walks of life, like people trying to transform business from within in recent years, the Capital Institute has started initiatives to work with people in regions to create these regen economy hubs at the bioregional scale. This movement is growing and the different players aren't necessarily fully aware of themselves yet. I'm also thinking of the Planetary Health Alliance with a network of universities and research institutions around the world. Doing the research and looking into the connections between planetary health, ecosystems health, population health and individual health. We need to really understand the intrinsic value of all life and planetary health to the whole community of life. And then there's organizations like Common Land in in the Netherlands who've developed functional strategies to do large scale ecosystems restoration working with local farmers and local landowners in specific areas around the world and transforming entire regions that are between 500,000 and a million hectares. The momentum is building. I think the next two years are critical. I'm still hopeful we are actually going to see this transformative change to become a global emergency response. It's it's only now that we're slowly beginning to link up the people who've pioneered works in in, in sustainable cities and sustainable architecture and in more biomaterials construction methodologies and so on and so forth with new um, pioneering in biomaterials and product design with all the, the wonderful work that is in kind of earth care and earth healing, ecotherapy from permaculture to agroforestry to analog forestry and all these other techniques that have been around for a while and have been improved over years and years of experimenting. And we also have lots of case studies to point at that we can, if we choose to have a positive impact on the environment that we inhabit. There are plenty of places around the world where large-scale regenerative agriculture projects have shown impressive ways the before and after that is possible in 15, 20 years. I'm thinking of the Lewis Plateau example that John Liu, who has now founded the Ecosystems Restoration Camp Foundation, reported on in the early 2000s. In China, an area of hundreds of square kilometers was being transformed from arid, eroding, semi-desert to 
lush terraces that are bioproductive with the springs coming back and the, the tree cover being permanent again and basically increasing the, the carbon content in the soil, drawing down carbon from the atmosphere, improving the bioproductivity of the area, improving the hydrology of the area, improving the, the amount of food that it generated and so on. These things are possible and they're examples all over the world. The way that life creates conditions conducive to life is by continuously experimenting with novelty and, and so things keep changing. Our planet sits within larger systems as well that also affect how the conditions on our planet change. There is no destination sustainability, there is no destination regenerative culture. It is a continuous community based process of learning of how to adapt and how to respond creatively to change. To do so in, in ways that we enable people to discover their own essence, their unique contribution to making the system more vibrant and more vital and more valuable, in, but in all levels of value, not just in economics ter uh, economic terms. We all have to walk that path. That is what life is all about, um, to be adaptive, resilient, and regenerative, respond to change. I'm Helena Norberg-Hodge, and I am the director of Local Futures. For the last almost 40 years, I've been promoting what I call decentralization or localization. And that's because I had the experience of working in cultures that had not been affected by the global market, cultures like Bhutan and Ladakh and later on uh, a lot of experience with places like Laos and many parts of the world. In the mid-70s, Ladakh or Little Tibet, it was a part of the world that had not been colonized nor developed in the modern era. And there I found a people who were still providing for all their basic needs from their own resources, producing a range of things, some vegetables, grain, they kept animals. They had their own architectural tradition of local materials. They still wove their own clothes from their own wool. And I started at first working on a dictionary and traveled, actually walked through the whole region. It's about the size of Austria. But in this high altitude desert, there were small villages that survived by irrigating the desert from glacial melt. As I got to know the people, I found that they were the most relaxed, the most joyous, the most vibrant people I had ever met. I also saw that the opening up to the area, to outside development, was beginning to bring rapid change. So I ended up starting projects to demonstrate an alternative to conventional development which among other things included demonstrating renewable energy as an alternative to fossil fuels. I also had my eyes open to the craziness in the global market. So I literally saw in a very short period after the area was opened up, butter that had traveled for more than a week coming in and being sold for half the price of butter that came from the farm next door. 
So this opened my eyes to then doing studies around the world as I was invited to speak or to start projects similar to the one in Ladakh. So that included Bhutan, I was in parts of Africa, invited to Mongolia, to, to Burma or Myanmar, to Laos. And everywhere I went, I would keep my eyes open for this, what was happening with the global market and what it was doing to the local production and local producers. And I found the same pattern. In Mongolia, where they had 20 million milk-producing animals, in Ulaanbaatar, most of the butter came from Germany. In Kenya, I found butter from Holland, costing half the price of local butter. And as I returned to Europe, I found the same thing. I became a passionate advocate of the need to strengthen local economies worldwide. Small producers, farmers, fishermen, forest workers, that were producing a range of things from diverse, adapted species of animals and plants were being replaced by bigger and bigger monocultures. And they were being pushed off the land into bigger and bigger cities. And in those cities, there were fewer and fewer jobs. Traditionally, in these cultures, there had been no such thing as unemployment. As people were driven off the land into larger and larger cities, all of them created through huge investments in fossil fuel-based infrastructure. There was the beginnings of tensions between people who had lived side by side in more local economies based on local resources, where they were interdependent, they depended on each other. Now suddenly they were dependent on anonymous institutions, vast bureaucracies, and there was this dreadful artificial scarcity of livelihoods, of jobs. After only about a decade of opening up the local market, the local economy, to outside development, these pressures led to violent conflict, to bloodshed. People who had lived together side by side for generations Most people have never experienced intact local economies. We have a historical development where colonialism and slavery already destroyed more diversified, self-reliant local economies. So once you have destroyed the fabric of interdependence, local interdependence, the fabric of more diversified production based on biodiversity, then it's very hard to see a clear path towards localization. Most people are not looking at the global system. This is not about good guys and bad guys. At some level, we all know that we depend on the living world. We all know that the real economy is the earth. But there is very little clarity, I think, about the way that we have lost sight of that. Politically, left and right in this regard is completely meaningless finding our way back to a genuinely sustainable way will require recognizing, first of all, that, that food is the most important production, product that we have. It's the only thing that every person needs every day of their life. The only thing. To allow a system where our governments are continuing to subsidize greater and greater distance between each individual and the source of their food, that that inefficiency is responsible by far for the, the ecocide that we're witnessing.
We have today a system that has allowed this to go so far that countries routinely import and export the same product. The U.S. exports about a billion tons of beef, turns around and imports about a billion tons of beef. The U.K. exports as much butter and milk as it imports. Right now, the U.K. is exporting 20 tons of bottled water to Australia. Australia is exporting 20 tons of water to the U.K. On top of that, in this global food system, we now have big business being basically condemned to roam the world for the cheapest labor. And that means that they will fly fish from Norway to be deboned in China and it's flown back again. Apples flown from England to South Africa to be washed and flown back again. This is going on on a massive and increasing scale while we talk about climate change. At the same time, the emissions from the, those planes and giant container ships that are shipping things back and forth, those emissions are not even calculated. This is not about some one evil corporation or that every CEO is evil or that every government is completely self-interested. This is about blindness to the workings of a global system that we are simply not looking at, and it requires effort. We need to look at the trends from a global point of view, but look at them on the ground. Local governments are responding more to the needs of people and the needs of the natural world. Both people and nature are diverse. This is a fundamental principle of life, a fact. And we change from moment to moment. This is true of every plant, of every animal, everything that lives. We must change the economy so that we do not destroy that uniqueness and that life. What is wonderful is that from the grassroots and very often through just individual initiatives, people who've had enough experience, there are a whole proliferation of positive initiatives that when you analyze them from a structural point of view, you see they are about localization. They're about reconnecting production and consumption, and they're about adapting and respecting the limits and the needs of the living world. When we make changes to the food economy, we're making very fundamental, very important changes. People care, most people care in every position. We want to do the right thing. Even in, a, in some of the newly emerging hubs for localization, towns like Portland, Oregon, or here where I am now in Byron Bay, Australia, people are moving there because there is more human scale community interaction People are known more for who they are, what they do, what they think, their values. So those are far more attractive places to live. The wonderful thing about localizing is that there is a structural relationship between shorter distances between the market and the farm so that the local market, the market closer to the farm, not only accepts diversity but demands diversity. It can't use 20 tons of straight carrots. It becomes economically interesting for the smaller farmer or even for a bigger one that decides to localize in order to survive economically to start diversifying. So I know of examples of farmers in America that were, you know, had been pressured to grow monocultures of tobacco almost all near bankruptcy, barely able to survive, who then would just convert a few acres of their land to a diverse range of vegetables to sell in the local market and were then able to start getting back on their feet again. If we look globally, we'll see there is such an urgent need to restore diversified food sovereignty allow people and farmers to produce for themselves first and then keep some of their land or some of the effort for export, whether to tourists or to another market. 
trade has always been there. So this is not about ending trade. When we start really exposing what's going on and we understand our absolute need to reduce energy consumption wherever possible, but more importantly almost, to restore biodiversity on the land, then a very different picture emerges. We need to look at how taxes, subsidies and regulations are used to favor monopolies. No self-respecting capitalist would actually believe in subsidizing monopolies. But that's what's going on. There is a shift going on. There is a waking up. It's almost like an intuitive reawakening to what's in our DNA. You see people coming out of the cities longing for that reconnection to the earth and to community. Community building combined with a deep spiritual reconnection to nature is an amazing therapy. So if we could just open our eyes, we would see a very, very clear path to healing at the deep psychological, personal, spiritual level and healing the earth. It's amazing how many people are actually wanting to live a life of deeper connection and caring. There are many ways that people are beginning to come together. One of them, of course, is local markets. There are also local business alliances. There's local financing, where various forms, where people, when they understand about localization, start finding ways of creating, for instance, a revolving fund in their neighborhood or with their local group that may be starting a food co-op, that may be starting a garden at their children's school. There are new singing groups. One of the things that held us together as communities in almost all traditional cultures was that we sang and danced and made music together. Only with the industrialization and commercialization of our lives that we become a spectator culture. This localization actually starts to help us regain many of the skills that we all have and many of the strengths we have, which we don't experience when we lead our anonymous consumer lifestyle. The most important thing we can do as individuals is to seek out like-minded people near where we live and perhaps meet regularly, cook a meal together. And once we start opening our eyes to it, we realize the problem is not humanity. The problem is the inhuman scale of an economic system that we simply have not been looking at. This is about how the global population can start providing for its needs and enriching its local economy. I want to see a growth. I want to see growth in healthy plants, healthy animals. I want to see a growth in the number of jobs. I want to see a growth in the number of businesses. Through the mega mergers, it looks like we're just going to have you know, one pharmaceutical company providing for the whole world, one seed company, one water company. No, we need to shift it so we have a genuine growth, a proliferation into a number that is appropriate. That's the goal of localization, not to end trade, but to restore democracy and to restore the responsibility of business to respond to ecological and cultural realities.
Thank you for listening to the second episode of Nordic by Nature on survival. Thank you very much to Monica Kucha. You can find Monica on Facebook, that's M-O-N-I-K-A-K-U-C-I-A, or her website, sialababamak.pl, that's S-I-A-L-A-B-A-B-A-M-A-K dot P-L. The Polish folk music you heard is from two different singing groups. The first group is from Golwoneki, who are making pierogi. The second singing ensemble you heard is from Dubrovoda. They have been singing together since 1968 and have received the Minister of Culture and National Heritage Award. Monica told me their names. Singers from Dobrovoda, Valentyna Klimowicz, Nina Jawdosiuk, Barbara Jakimiuk, Julita Harytoniuk, Gołcunecki, singers from Radomskie, Maria Siwiec, Jadwiga Dziedzic, Zofia Kucharczyk, Maria Oracz, Maria Pęzik, Maria Rokicka. Thank you also to Daniel Wall. You can find Daniel on Twitter at Dr. DC Wall, that's W A H L, and on Facebook at Regenerative Cultures and at Ecological Consciousness. Daniel's book, Designing Regenerative Cultures, is published by triarchypress.net. Daniel also has a blog on Medium at Design for Sustainability. See danielchristianval.com. And finally, thanks to Helena Norbeg Hodge. Helena is the founder of the International Alliance for Localization and the not for profit Local Futures. Please see localfutures.org for tips on how to get started making changes in your local area. Music and sound has been arranged by Diego Losa, and you can find Diego on his website, diegolosa.blogspot.com. If you are interested in mindfulness and resilient thinking, please read about RJ Rastogi's Village Homestay Retreats on foundnature.org. The retreats are based in a village called Mashkali in Uttarakhand, India, in the foothills of the Himalayas. You can follow the Foundation for the Contemplation of Nature on Facebook and follow RJ on Instagram at Contemplation of Nature. Nordic by Nature is an imaginarylife.net production created with the support of the Nordic Ministries. Please help us by sharing a link to this podcast with the hashtag Traces of North. And please follow us on Instagram at Nordic by Nature Podcast. We'd love to hear your thoughts on our podcast, so please email me, Tanya, on nordicbynature at imaginarylife.net.